Thank you. Yeah, we are uh, located right here working in ports throughout the uh, United States and the world. And so anytime I'm out in a, in a port environment talking about maritime security, they say, where's Mariner from? And I say, I'm from uh, South Carolina. And they say, oh, Charleston is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Charleston is lovely, but uh, we like Columbia. And um, <clears throat> I also wanted to quickly mention, you know, ITology has been great. Uh, Mariner has been a partner in ITology for a number of years. And I really want to thank Lonnie for uh, following Garima for me so that, uh, you know, I would imagine following Garima had to be, feel, if I were doing it, I would feel like those two guys trying to beat Watson at Jeopardy. So <laughs> anyway, um, uh, we've been uh, designing tools for situation awareness uh, for uh, almost 12 years, and we focus primarily on the maritime security domain. But situation awareness is going mainstream. We all need it. As a matter of fact, you probably used it today. Um, you probably used GPS to find the location. Or you may have checked the weather to decide what to wear. Or uh, you may have talked to other people to decide whether to attend this conference. This is all situation awareness. Now, the title of my talk today uh, is Social Tools in an Anti-Social Domain. So that was an attempt to have a cheeky title. Uh, and I have to admit, I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. So I'm going to tell you what I'm really going to talk about today. And it's really about this antisocial domain is situation awareness. And what I really mean is talking about repurposing social networking tools into this new environment, uh, repurposing the social, social networking constructs into situation awareness to, to make it better. And, um, <clears throat> you know, my customers... Uh, they live and die by situation awareness. They're cops, they're firemen, uh, they're port authorities, they're mostly pragmatic, uh, you know, get it done sort of people. They really don't have time for computers and nonsensical things like data structures and, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff that we deal with. They hate social. Uh, they are an anti-social domain. Uh, I don't even use the word when I'm out in the field. I cannot say it. They're afraid to share because, you know, often they're dealing with sensitive information. So they are trying to be careful. And to a paramedic, going viral sounds like the start of a very bad day. <laughs> so we avoid that kind of language. You know, and this is what my clients think of as social networking. You know, who can blame them? At best, they see social networking as a mild waste of time. However, we've been repurposing social networking constructs such as following, likes, news feeds, any others you can think of. Uh, of course, friending seems pointless to my customers. But we really use those concepts to build a collaborative environment that energizes situation awareness. If we apply social networking tools uh, for the surgical sharing of information rather than the unfettered viral distribution, it becomes a powerful ally for situation awareness in rapidly changing circumstances. Think of how quickly social media fueled movements like the Arab Spring in the Middle East. You know, situation awareness was born in cockpits and command centers, but its future may very well lie in Facebook and Twitter. The key is to translate these tools in ways that make sense to social phobics. I'm going to talk about two ways that we've used social tools to transform situation awareness. You know, the first step is looking at social networking as a kind of sensor. Situation awareness depends on sensors. Uh, it starts with our five senses. Perceiving the area around us, understanding how things relate to us, and projecting the impact of changes in our surroundings. As you build situation awareness over larger and larger areas, you become dependent on other sensors and technologies like radar, cameras, data systems, uh, tracking systems, etc. Those are the traditional sensors of situation awareness. However, with the ubiquity of smartphones and social apps such as Twitter, they can become sensors on their own. Now, during the BP oil spill uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, Coast Guard Admiral Thad Allen uh, saw his team overwhelmed by thousands of telephone reports of various oil sightings along the coasts of Texas and Louisiana. He was also directing thousands of resource hours in, uh, with airplanes and coastal patrols to detect the massive size of the oil plume. Aircraft overflights, coastal patrols, and scientific plume modeling were giving him 
part of the picture, but at the same time, thousands of volunteers keen to make some, take some action were reporting sightings daily. It was happening so much that Admiral Allen coined a term, spontaneous unaffiliated volunteers, or SUVs. <laughs> As you can imagine, these people were all driving around wanting to help. But because of his inability to really marshal the SUVs, to focus their efforts, because it was disconnected, uncentralized, it didn't have this military hierarchy that he was used to, uh, the responders were overwhelmed, uh, and they couldn't really work with this new data. You know, they set up hotlines, they took reports, but uh, it was just too much. Uh, even though he realized how valuable the data was, he couldn't use it. Imagine, though, if you could employ something like Twitter or other social media, uh, something that the SUVs were already familiar with. Most of these platforms support geotagged posts and photo uploads. Combine that with a public, a service, a public service announcement that asks people to make uh, reports at hashtag oil sightings. Oh, I'm sorry, that's hashtag oil sightings. And uh, in, in whatever social media, and have a nice integration pulling all this together, you know, could really look something like this. Now, on this side is a regular plume model. This is a scientific model that we use and integrate into our software for our customers to take a look at. And each one of these dots represents uh, oil concentration. So you can, and the red line here shows where it's moving along with the tides and currents over a period of time. And the red dots are showing where the projections are for the oil to come up ashore. And that's often where the Coast Guard and other uh, oil response agencies would be pre-positioning forces to deal with the oil on the shore. But now, on the right, I've overlaid our, our uh, Twitter plume concept, if you will. If we were to integrate with Twitter and take that information, those geotag posts and the photographs, and start to easily uh, ingest that into our various situational awareness software and show them, hey, not only is the science telling you this, but the people are telling you this, and by the way, here's what it looks like. So you can see, using this would save thousands of hours trying to process those telephone reports, which, and all that went to waste anyway. Uh, and with something like this, first responders really have hundreds of thousands of sensors volunteering all along the coastline. But unfortunately, with the internet afloat in a sea of cat videos, the mere mention of a Twitter integration to make some of my customers imagine something more like this. <laughs> so the oil spill example shows uh, the public feeding first responders with critical information. But you know, authorities can also share situation awareness with the public, and that's, you know, we already have a lot of structures in place to do that, the emergency broadcast system, just regular media outlets, et cetera. But <clears throat> We've taken it one step further. In Miami, we created a Twitter account for the Miami River bridges. We used geospatial processing to send tweets when bridge openings were imminent based on vessel traffic. Since many of the bridges are major thoroughfares in downtown Miami, broadcasting this kind of awareness had the potential to create a lot of followers for the Miami River bridges. And because we've automated these posts through our situation awareness software, we've brought the bridges to life in a way. We've given them a social life. And based on the number of followers, these bridges have a better social life than I do. <laughs> so what that really leads to is my next point. So remember Web 2.0? Uh, Web 2.0 is kind of an old idea that talked about, it was really our growth phase in how to use the web. It was us as developers and IT professionals learning how to take the web from just static pages into dynamic, you know, real world content and you know, almost application-based as it is today. Uh, well, now in 2014, of course, it's the Internet of Things. And all of these things are going to be connected in the new Internet. Uh, you can log into your thermostat now. So all of these things, or entities, as we call them at Mariner, they're going to be brought to life, and they're going to have a lot to say. So in order to account for these concepts, uh, while designing for situation awareness, we've called them social entities. They're inanimate objects that have a social life. And let me show you what I mean. So a common item in most social networks is the check-in, right? A person checks in at a place, Foursquare. Um, you've probably done some social media, and people have probably checked in here today. Anyone done a check-in here? Great. So um, 
Hopefully your name's not Bubba. So, but a lot of these check-ins are sort of nonsensical, right? Bubba has checked in at Sam's Hot Dog Shack. Well, that's not that compelling to a fire chief who's trying to manage 100 people in a multi-day disaster response. But turn Bubba into Fire Truck 2, checking in not at Sam's Hot Dog Shack, but rather at the site of an incident. And now the fire chief doesn't even see a social tool, just a social awareness tool, uh, I'm sorry, situation awareness tool, uh, keeping track of resources and activities and bringing them to life. So we're giving these inanimate objects a social life through a number of technologies, geospatial processing, simple tracking devices, smartphones, and simple apps downloaded during the incident response phase. I'm going to go over a couple of more examples. So this is Charleston, uh, and uh, we love Charleston. And, but this is the transit of a vessel into Charleston. Um, it's an artistic representation of their track. They were not drunk when they were entering the, the water here. That's a little, little loopy. But um, anyway, you know, typical situation awareness might give you a map view of this vessel's transit. And that might be useful to the Coast Guard. But if, a cab, if you're a cab driver, how useful is this? If you are working at the docks, how useful is this? If you're not watching the map the whole time, how useful is it? You really don't see that whole track. You just see kind of the orange triangle, which is where the ship is right now. But turning that transit into a news feed of uh, check-ins by the vessel at various landmarks as they transit the harbor allows us to repurpose a number of social tools in ways that make sense to a broader user base throughout the port. So here you can see a few things, and feel free to ask about anything on the screen. This is a bit of a mock-up, but this is based on real software that we have running. We just made it bigger so we could see it here. But you can see uh, the Washington George is the name of our ship. And rather than looking at the map and seeing where they're going, we can actually see a nice history here of check-ins. They entered Charleston Harbor. They passed the bridge. They passed Haines Point, which I made that up. And then they entered Wando Terminal Berth 2. You don't need to be a maritime professional to understand what's going on with the vessel's transit. And of course, people now can select follow. So follow, it's a concept that we've gotten from social media. And, uh, but really, all it is is it allows people to subscribe to notifications of changes for any of these items. And more specifically, you can follow the vessel or you could follow a specific bridge. So if you're following a vessel, you're getting notifications via SMS or whatever you want. Uh, as it passes landmarks, if you're following the bridge, you're getting a notification every time somebody goes under the bridge. Now that bridge might tell you that, hey, that vessel is probably, you know, 20 minutes from the pier. People get used to what goes on. So they understand how to use that information. So it could trigger a variety of workflows throughout the port. Think of it this way. If that vessel were a cruise ship, subscribing to notifications when the ship passed a particular landmark could really save taxi cabs thousands of hours by preventing them from lining up too early uh, before the ship's arrival. And then in turn, the taxi drivers could interact with this by uh, being in the environment all the time. They see what's normal. And when they see something that's abnormal, they could tweet something like hashtag see something, say something, and kind of give the, the people uh, a heads up of something that doesn't look normal to them. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of inner, uh, the social media constructs here really allow for a lot of interplay between uh, the people working in the port, the maritime security professionals, the larger port authorities, and of course businesses all along the perimeter of the port. And there's also another small change here. You know, a lot of times you see in uh, public or in social media, they transform the times. So you see things like this. It's four hours ago instead of seeing digits and colons. That time transformation seems useful in social media, but in the parlance of situation awareness design, this is actually reducing the cognitive load for someone trying to maintain situation awareness. Someone trying to keep track of so many different pieces, they don't have to look at 12, 15, and uh, 20 seconds and figure out that was four hours ago. It just does it for them. So those are minor little things that really help the overall uh, situation awareness and help the human understand this context better and faster. 
So this is an actual live screenshot of another piece of our software. It's a recent integration we've completed. And this is deployed to a customer. So this is an integration with an access point system. Access point systems, they're basically the sector that is the card readers for doors and gates. So anytime you flash a badge to unlock the door, that's the kind of system this is integrated to. So we've taken the idea of a doorway and given it a social life by integrating with the card reader system. So if you would look at the card reader system, you'd get this stream of events. Uh, card 7 was displayed at badge ID reader 752 at uh, 1252 minutes on you know, 1017. What we've done is transform all that into this social context. So let's walk around the screen here a little bit. Over here, we have the, uh, the, so the stream, what we're calling the news feed, uh, from the event system. So that's telling us all the different things that the system is doing. Over here, we have two videos. This thumbnail and this larger area can be swapped. So this is the live view right now. And this is the replay. We've selected incident number two here. Terry Hayes accessed the door with a yellow trick badge. That's a type of badge that my customers are familiar with. And by the user selecting this item now from the stream, uh, we immediately populate this area, and we immediately pull back the video replay of that exact timestamp. So right now, somebody who didn't actually witness that live could look back and say, this is the information from the badge, by the way. So that's their ID photo on the badge. And they can look at it and say, oh, well, that is Terry Hayes coming through the door. So um, you can see we've really transformed through a lot of these social networking constructs all of the information. And before, this used to be on multiple screens and a lot of very ugly uh, user interface. You know, and it was very table-oriented, lots of lists. And it wasn't all really pulled together in the way we've done it to make it a better uh, improvement for situation awareness. So I think my time is almost up, but I hope that you can see how we've repurposed a lot of the uh, social constructs to give life to this doorway. Uh, during the q and I'd love to hear some of your um, ideas for repurposing social tools in your antisocial domains. And to bring it all to a close, I just wanted to talk about you know, Connections 2014 was, among many things, intended to highlight uh, efforts to increase adoption of new technologies. Now, it's not like we need to help the adoption rates of Facebook and Twitter. But by looking at social tools as sensors that give life to the Internet of Things or social entities, Mariner compelling solutions. Thank you. Great. Once again, we're going to uh, take some questions from the crowd. My mic is a little bit off. But um, does anybody have one? And we'll pass the microphone around. Just ask you to talk in the mic first. There we go. You have a, um, I guess, a, a thing. You can control hashtags and ats and you know at replies and that kind of stuff. But what do you do when you're doing about the, uh, I guess, the oil siding? I mm -hmm. mean, would you just take a trending hashtag, or would you, or would you um, just search for ones that might apply to what you're doing? Right. So the uh, the implication there is that, is that through say the the Twitter API, you're able to go in and, and mine that information from Twitter based on that hashtag. So. That's why it was kind of talk, it was a partnership between public relations getting the message out. And we've seen this at various events, you know, make your tweets to be hashtag uh, ITology or hashtag connections 2014, and everybody can sort of stay connected and see what else, what each other are saying. That's how, that's how it works today. We're just applying it a little bit differently and using their own API for our purposes. So nothing we were really proposing stretches or flexes Twitter. We use it just as it is and bring it into a different context and make it more valuable. Did that answer your question? Um, do you process the hashtags for like if people fat finger a hashtag, you know, they're really excited, oh my god, I saw an oil spill, and like they would fat finger it? How would you process that, or would you? We don't, really. But um, 
it, it would just be a matter of a development cycle to kind of keep improving on that. Perhaps Watson could do it for us. <laughs> yes, sir. With the check-ins, um, is it an auto check-in or is it checking in at any pre uh, anything that's set within its route? Yeah, I, I skipped over a bunch of different things there and kind of grouped them all under geospatial processing. But the implication with the check-in with the fire truck, I think you're referring to, is that we have a track on the fire truck, many uh, public resources like that, police cars, fire trucks, they're already being tracked in some, with some technology. Vessels are being tracked with what's called AIS. It's similar to the way aircrafts, uh, aircraft shares their position. Um, so we're pulling all that together. So we're assuming there's a track on that item. And then we're assuming that the situation awareness people are putting together um, for the incident a particular zone that we would be processing against. What would be the difference in just picking up, of course, everybody creates their own check-ins for every, every place you pass, of it checking in at those just random check-ins or it would be specific ones only that it would pick up? Yeah, we would kind of do both. So for the inanimate objects, they can't really check in themselves. So it's all about our automated uh, bits underneath in our software called Command Bridge where we set up the zones and we set up how the check-ins are supposed to process. And we also are setting up the items that we're tracking each have a profile so we kind of know a little bit about what, they're, what they are, what they're called, that sort of thing. So um, that's all automated through the use of general geospatial tools, zones, uh, tripwires, tracking, et cetera. In terms of the SUVs, um, are you when when there's a specific event that happens, are you creating are are you sending out a tweet as right as it happens, saying, "Hey, if you see something, use this hashtag," or are you not sending out anything and creating a list of basic hashtags that you can search, and if if one of those hashtags pops up, and that's hopefully something relevant. Well, there's certainly a lot of room to grow here, but uh, conceptually, what we were talking about is. Uh, controlling the media. So anytime there's one of these national events, and uh, I, I'm also a retired Coast Guard officer, so I'm very familiar with this kind of response, they stand up a media affairs branch, and they're talking to the reporters, and they, they use that, uh, that channel to just advertise the fact that this is the hashtag to use. And so we're just basically saying, use the existing public media. That's just another form of social media, actual media and uh, trying to control the message for us to be able to then go into something as ubiquitous as Twitter and reuse the information. Does that make sense? I was thinking about that oil spill incident, and so here's my question. How do you differentiate between the pranksters who are thus providing you with information that's no longer relevant or might even be... Uh, useless or, or sabotaging towards you getting to the right places at the right time? Well, in that uh, example, it was really about the crowdsourcing of the reports. And so the reports are going to center in somewhere, and they're going to compare it to their plume models and look and see if they're the same or different, and be able to then target the resources that they have, rather than, uh, I mentioned how they were sending out the resources to track the plume, but wouldn't it be better? And they were basically creating giant search areas for thousands of square miles, um, somewhat informed by the science, but also just trying to get the full scope of the damage assessment, right? Uh, so it would be just using the fact that there's this huge cluster of reports from this area. There's a couple of outliers. It would just be, uh, the idea is it's a tool to help the real decision makers, the humans, finally, who are deciding. To make some more better informed decisions. We can take one more. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, what happens once you've got your users convinced and indoctrinated and working with this technology, and then there is a big event, and the first thing that happens is the lights go out and the cell system is overwhelmed? Uh, And um, I try to avoid it. <laughs> Part of what we do is um, provide hosting so the software is elsewhere so it wouldn't be affected by the, uh, the damage area. But when you're talking about the, the Twitter integrations and things like that, um, little known fact, the emergency 
the network faster than the public, uh, particularly on SMS. Um, and the whole Twitter idea, you know, um, yes, yeah. depend on a public infrastructure, but uh, for, for those kinds of damage uh, assessments. And so if everything is gone, the lights are out. Um, but it could be also, uh, you know, the geospatial processing was really only one element. It could be other things, tweets from people outside the zone talking about, like after Katrina, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were on this list of missing persons, but they weren't missing, they would just evacuate, right? And they went to some great aunt's house up in Maine that they hadn't visited for a while or whatever, and they kind of fell off the map, and other members of the family might have thought they were dead or still in the storm, and so, you know, I think the idea is just to be able to grow this idea of uh, social media being used to gather information, maybe not particularly geospatial information right from the scene, but other types of information as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time.